So my name is Christoph, and uh, I did my PhD at the Max Planck Institute of Quantum Optics in Munich before I moved here to Cambridge. So we're also in Cambridge, like <laughs> new quantum. It's not working yours either. Christoph. It's not working either. <laughs> so I guess I'll have to do it with just the title slide. <laughs> <laughs> so when I moved here to Cambridge, I started working on quantum algorithms, and that's my job here at River Lane. I don't know why the formatting is messed up, though. Yeah, I think we've got control down Anyway, if we can advance. Yeah, perfect. perfect. It seems to work. So, yeah. so thank you everybody for waiting uh, through all of these technical delays, especially because this is the most boring session of all. <laughs> the other talks were all vetted and selected by an independent scientific committee. And here, I just get to flick through some ads. <laughs> so my ad number one is the Delta Flow control box. So this is a control system for qubits. And as you can see here, it has a few RF outs. And inside is a Xilinx RF SOC, uh, which you can program in order to control the qubits exactly the way you want. And the special thing about this Delta Flow control box is the Delta Flow control software, which is a Python library and it allows you to program the pulses in Python. And uh, you can easily set up the way the pi pulses are supposed to be and also like which pulses are supposed to be uh, synchronous on different outputs. And you can set this up uh, very, very detailed at very high accuracy. So I said, I work on quantum algorithms, so very far away from this um, control system. But we had like a demo day at our company. And then even after a few minutes, I understood how you can program this. So it must be um, kind of simple. <laughs> OK, so River Lane, what we do, this is kind of the bottom part of the stack. We don't actually work on qubits and build any qubits ourselves. There's various other yeah, places and labs and companies that do that. Instead, we work on everything above the qubits. So you already saw the control system. Then a big part of what we focus on is deltaflow.os, which is this operating system that does error correction for quantum computers. And then we also have the applications, which is where I work on the very top. And I think this error correction is a very fundamental part of the quantum computing stack, uh, because we need this to unlock the high value applications. So this is a diagram here, which I found like on some slide repository on SharePoint. And you can see the <laughs> y-axis is like the market value of the applications of quantum computing, and the x-axis is the system size. And if you don't use error correction, you run into this NISC barrier. Now, please do not ask me why the NISC barrier is at <laughs> $3.5 billion. I can't tell you. <laughs> But I did select this picture because I agree with the sentiment, which is that if we can access and use quantum error correction, we can run a lot more algorithm for a lot more different use cases and much higher value applications. And so this is a fundamental part of the quantum stack. And once we have many qubits, we will need quantum error correction to make them useful. And this is what we are working on. And quantum error correction, I mean, everybody here knows a bit about it, I guess. Um, it's a, scientifically very challenging because you can't just directly measure your qubits as you would in classical error correction because then the quantum information is destroyed and gone. But you have to measure syndromes and then from that you have to decode in order to find out what errors actually happened to then correct them. And this is not just a scientific problem, scientifically challenging, but it's also an engineering challenge. So this here is a back of the envelope calculation for a quantum computer of uh, one million physical qubits. It seems far off, but eventually we want to reach this. And I, I like this because it exemplifies the vast scale of the problem, and that it's not just scientific, but also a, a tremendous engineering problem. But we have to process like Netflix, but basically somehow local to the quantum computer and in real time just to do like error correction. And this problem here is what River Lane is solving and working on such that other companies can focus on building the best possible qubits. OK, so going back. Um, OK, so it 
Sometimes when you hear about the product, it can still feel kind of elusive of what the company actually does. And so I want to go into a bit more details of what teams we have and what they actually do. We've already heard about the control team, but works on the control system with which you can control the qubits. And then we also have a noise team, which models physical qubit noise. Because while our OS um, will and is supposed to work with different qubits type, qubit types, we do understand that every qubit is unique and uh, has its advantages and other drawbacks. And so the noise team understands this and models different qubits and uh, their noise. Then we have the design team, which explores different error correction codes. And here again, this can depend on hardware, right? Because the noise will be different, the connectivity might be different, and then different codes may also be suitable for different applications and they will have different properties. And we want to understand them. Then we have the decode team, which looks at how to actually decode the syndrome measurements. And the decode team, they look at different decoding algorithms and also implementations that can be more efficient. And then finally, we have the silicon team, which work on dedicated hardware decoders. So dedicated hardware that implements the decoding algorithms. And we believe that we will need dedicated hardware decoders for a few reasons. So one reason is that they are simply much faster than running things on a CPU. Um, which we need because you saw the tremendous uh, data, rate of data that we have to process. Uh, then also they will be more energy efficient uh, than if you run a lot of supercomputers. And also at scale they will be much cheaper because we will need a lot of these decoding chips um, if we want to have a large gigantic quantum computer. And along this way, along this journey, uh, we make new findings and we do research. And then we are involved in the academic community and publish this and also disseminate it at conferences like this one here, QC tip. So for example, there was a poster. So unfortunately, they were all taken down yesterday about um, this hardware decoding. But there is also a talk coming up, which you can uh, watch tomorrow afternoon, uh, which is about parallel window decoding. So this would fall into the category of decoding algorithms. So this is about deltaflow.os. And I also want to spend some time talking about the very top part, which is applications and algorithms, uh, which I think is important for two reasons. So one reason is that that's the team I work in. <laughs> and the other reason is that without like industrially valuable applications that have a quantum benefit, kind of the economic point of the everything else it's still academically interesting, but maybe from an economic perspective, it's a bit moot. And in the Discover team, that's what we call our applications and algorithms team, uh, we uh, do research on quantum algorithms, and it was also actually featured at QC Tip. So this here is a project about a quantum algorithm for um, computing the ground state energy of periodic solids. And this could maybe one day help to understand and design better catalyzers. Um, yeah, there was a poster yesterday, like all of these are posters which are gone, but the people are still here, so you can still ask them about some more details if you're interested. Uh, then this is another work which is about uh, data input in quantum computing. So we actually heard about block encodings earlier today, which is the input model that you need if you are using the quantum singular value transform or related algorithms. And if your data, if your matrices have some kind of structure, like patterns with repeated elements and symmetries, um, then what this preprint here does is it gives you like a blueprint and an idea, a path that you can follow in order to construct an efficient block encoding circuit for your matrix. Uh, this is very recent. It was, um, I mean, you can see from the archive identifier that it's uh, from April. Uh, where we run statistical phase estimation and error mitigation, and we actually run this on actual hardware. Uh, so we also do uh, things in this direction. Uh, though most of our research is focused on the fault tolerant direction because we uh, work very much on error correction. So the, yeah, the top two will need error corrected quantum computers. And we also have internship schemes. So yesterday there was also a poster of a previous intern uh, who worked on a project about uh, properties on quantum computers that go beyond uh, the ground state energy. 
So at this point, uh, I should mention that we are hiring. We still have uh, some ads on our website. And we also have this internship scheme, like where PhD students will join us for half a year. Um, so this year's scheme is closed, but um, probably there will be another one next year. Now at this point, I could tell you about our values, but you can find them on the website. Instead, I want to mention that we have beer <laughs> and cider <laughs> and gin tonics. <laughs> and you can enjoy all of these together with your colleagues. So going back to the title of my talk, which was Building uh, the OS for Error-Corrected Quantum Computing, um, basically this is the secret, because it's the team from different backgrounds working together to um, yeah, build the OS. Thank you. Thanks very much, Christoph. Questions? One already. What is that? <laughs> yeah. So this is um, kind of our logo. I have a sticker of this on my laptop, and it's an artist's impression of a block sphere. So if you go, at least I think that's what it is. <laughs> so if you go to our website, you will actually find an animated version of this, where it like spins, and like this is one still, and then it like spins, and then it looks like this, like because the qubit is somehow evolving and changing. Okay. Any more questions? <laughs> um, how would you say what Rivlane does differs from what QBlox does? Because it sounds quite similar. Yeah, that's a very good question, I think. So I think what we do on uh, the error correction and OS side and the algorithm applications is something that um, QBlox didn't, doesn't, if I understood your, yeah, but you're nodding. So there's something which goes beyond, but I think the control system is kind of very similar to QBlox, and I think we are a competitor there for the control system. And um, because I work on the algorithms, which is very far away, as you can see from the control system, I don't know if I'm tall enough to actually reach. Um, I don't know the details of how they differ. One final question, perhaps? Oh, there's one on the balcony. A mic's coming around. Hi. Uh, just one question. When, when you say operating system, can you clarify a bit more what you mean by, by that and what's inside of your operating system besides what we see in this uh, nice slide? So for operating system, I would take the term quite literally and not think of like Mac OS or Windows or something or Linux, but more like that the quantum computer is an incredibly complex machine and we have to operate it and build a system which operates it in the way we want it to behave, which is doing error correction and then ultimately running our circuits. And so this is what the operating system does. Thanks very much again to Christoph. Okay.